Welcome everyone to the Change Starts Here podcast. I'm your host, Dustin Odom. And this week's guest is a very dear friend of mine who I've known for close to 15, it feels like 20 years now. And besides being a dear friend, she is someone who's inspired me since the moment I met her. She's someone who's constantly challenging the status quo and thinking about what is possible for serving all kids and all adults in the future. She wrote a book recently that came out, I guess about a month ago, called Making It, What Today's Kids Need for Tomorrow's World. And it's an awesome read that all, you know, it's, it's very high level, but also comes down to very practical execution. What, what can we do now? It's a book I would encourage every educator to think about and look into. Um, the, the things that I found fascinating this week are Stephanie really dives into what the future of work and the future of education should look like. She looks into uh, the question is, is this education system working for everyone? Um, I would just encourage you, if you've got 20, 30 minutes to stay with us, have your life changed by Stephanie. She is an incredibly thoughtful individual, incredibly talented. And again, her book, Making It, is one that can change a lot of people's lives. So please join us. Uh, Steph, we start every, um, as we talked before, we start every podcast with the same question. Who are you and why do you love what you do? So I am Stephanie Malia Kraus. My first name starts with an S uh, because my dad is Jewish and the Jewish tradition is that you are supposed to name your child after the, the uh, person who passed most recently, the most recent ancestor. But the thing about my family is that we're not very traditional. And so there's there is both honoring and departing, which is kind of a theme for everything in my life. But that is the first name. Um, Malia, because I'm native Hawaiian. And my while my dad is Jewish, my mom is Hawaiian, um, brought in, you know, into life with these really intense storytelling cultures. Um, and so that is that is a part of my Hawaiian identity. And Kraus, I'm a mom and married. Um, Evan is my husband. And while I love my family, I was less fond of my maiden name and glad <laughs> to give it up for an easy one like Kraus. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think that um, being a mom in this moment is probably core to my identity. And it extends out into the roles that I've held as an educator, I've been a teacher, I've run a school, I ran an education nonprofit, have worked um, kind of schoolhouse to White House on education issues. And I'm a social worker, a counselor and a coach. And I think that across all of the spaces where I've been able to work and raise kids, there is deep lifetime investment to every kid and every family that I come in contact with. And now that I have my own children, I understand how that is, that's my mama bear. Um, and I, so I think that that really forms the core of, of my identity. Mm -hmm. So I, I, we've known each other for about 15 years now, and obviously that has nothing to do with why you're here. And I want to be clear with that just because like, I would love to talk to you any day of the week. I still remember the first time we met probably some 15 years ago, you coming into my office at a nonprofit that both of us worked at, and you just kind of wowing me with your outside the box ideas and your questions and thoughts. Like you oozed sincerity, you oozed passion, and you used uh, vision, right? And I had no idea where it was about to go. I just knew that I felt blessed just to be in your presence. And so it's really cool that we're talking here today. Um, so for the guest, you kind of hinted at it, you said schoolhouse to White House. Um, I would like for folks to understand what that means a little bit more before we dive into your book, because it's so crazy, uh, the, the journey you've had that's brought you here today. It's a wild ride. Like when I look back at my life and I think about um, just what it has looked like so far, it it surprises me. And with distance, I think um, 
it feels really special and sacred that this has gotten to be my life. And so I think when I think back 15 years to that oozing of energy um, and sort of unbridled enthusiasm for what can we do and, and how should we be educating kids and what's needed in the community we both called home. Um, my, my life is so much this uh, extension of grace for something I never imagined having. So I think the first part that I want your listeners to understand is that um, in order for me to love learning and my work, I had to leave school. And that's a really like dislocating part of my story. I, I grew up in a small town in New Jersey. I'm one of five and I dropped out of school. Um, and uh, more, more than 20 years ago, got sober, officially signed out, got a GED. And what's funny to me now is that I've run a high school and spent a lot of my time advising on high school related issues. But I actually didn't go. Um, I went to a little bit of ninth grade, but the last full year I completed was eighth grade and started at community college and then went to a small school in Florida, um, taught in Phoenix, Arizona, taught fifth grade. And in between teaching, I spent my summers in East Africa and got to participate and watch in um, teacher training, but for university students who were going back to their home villages where there was a desperate need for more educators. Um, and they were leaving university to, to go home and to help raise the next generation. And so um, I left the classroom. So this is a theme, a little bit of leaving these traditional education environments to keep um, moving forward in that sort of passion and vision. And what I started to learn really quickly, both captured in my own life, in the, the lives of my four brothers, um, the lives of my students in Phoenix, and through uh, the young people who I met in, in Malawi, was um, that sometimes there is a difference between what young people need to be ready for life in adulthood for life in general to grow up and what we get to experience in school that there is a gap between completing high school and true readiness for life after it mm -hmm. and so that became this charge for me so Dustin when you and I met uh, in the city where we were both living and working St. Louis Young people were hemorrhaging out of some of the comprehensive high schools, which you have deep connections to. And a lot of them were being pushed and pulled out of school because life was happening. Um, and that didn't mean that, you know, like my own story, that they didn't want to learn or have a good life or take care of their families. Um, and so I had the, the privilege and opportunity and, and hard, painful work of working with community partners and the school district and the university community to develop and run a school for youth who were older who had had to leave because of life yep. and these were 17 to 21 year olds um, and so that was the journey on the front lines you know today we get to talk about this book and so um, i left the front lines eight years ago when my second child was born and um, took on that question of what do young people need to truly be ready for life um, as the charge and the continued mission that we couldn't actually solve for while I was running the school. There were a lot of insights, but I, I couldn't deliver on the mission to, to those students. Um, and so for the last eight years, I've been charging after that question and wrote the book really as sort of a love letter back to the front lines, you know, eight years now working nationally has been spent with policymakers and influencers and scientists and researchers learning so much more about how we learn and develop and what the world is really like and the workforce is really like. And unfortunately, I really didn't get any of that training or insight when I was in the classroom or when I was running a school. 
Yeah, I do think it's funny like you say, yeah, you know, I was on the front lines running a school. You started an organization to aggressively go after this marginalized people group and serve them well. And again, I know that you didn't hit all the goals that maybe you had, but I felt like, uh, you know, he, yes, you were a school leader, but I feel like it was so much more. And I, I think the theme that I constantly see from you is even if it's like do this and then stop for a second and do something, you're always building on what you learn to make more of an impact. And I think, you know, we're close enough to where I can give you real feedback on anything, particularly a book that you do want real feedback on. Um, uh, and I loved it. And I loved it not because um, my friend, but I loved it because the insights that you you try to draw out about what is education really need to look like, what's the future of work look like, is uh, there with real practical advice of how I can, as an educator or a parent, dive into this and lean into this to get my kids ready for a world that no one truly knows what to, to get ready for. So as we start, one question I am I'm curious about, in the book, you know, it's stated somewhere that the public school system is outdated. Why do you think it's outdated? because of when it was designed and how it was architected. So there are a couple of pieces to this answer. Um, one is that our, our typical school model, uh, the way that we sort of cut up and order a sequencing that looks at elementary and then middle and then high school, and you move up this escalator or sort of across this conveyor belt, was designed for farm kids to become factory workers. It's steeped deeply in the industrial model. Um, and because of what was happening at that time during the industrial revolution, it was also designed for those who were becoming factory workers, which was predominantly the white and, and middle class and wealthy. And so the first piece about it um, being outdated is to understand that not only are schools designed in ways that are outdated, but designed in ways that are deeply inequitable. And I'll give a really, you know, some listeners to the podcast have probably heard of, of the sort of designing inadequacies of, okay, this is a factory model. We talk about that. But the way in which that shows up in a very kind of specific way is back to the school in St. Louis. When we started the high school, we had 17 to 21 year olds who enrolled and they would have three or four or five credits only. You needed 18 to graduate. And the reason why they only had three or four at 17 was that they had a mismatch of incompletes and withdrawals. And for those people who aren't um, watching, Dustin is nodding his head because he's probably remembering students and the actual experience as I'm talking about this. And um, in the state of Missouri at the time, one unit of credit, remember you needed 18 to graduate, required 7,820 minutes of instruction, which has absolutely no relationship to the science of learning and development. It is an arbitrary number that was used to segment and create perfect sort of mathematical blocks of um, allocating pensions, retirement system. It's the Carnegie unit. It's one of many ways that um, schools were architected to go to scale for this mass shift in what the workforce was going to need to do. Now, you've always had thought leaders in education, Paulo Freire, Dewey, others who've pushed on that, but that's how it ran. So that's the first, right? Deeply inequitable and outdated. But then the second really hones in on adolescence, and that is this social contract that's really the philosophical commitment and covenant that people are operating out of, which is outdated and inequitable for different reasons. And what that says is the way to succeed in America, the American dream, economic opportunity, is that you go through high school and you graduate and then you go to college and you graduate, and then you get a job, and then you get better jobs, better pay, 
and eventually you retire and you leave money for your kids. And the problem is that that social contract has never worked for everyone. But one of the things that I heard in eight years in national work and sitting in these conversations, thinking and talking about the future of the economy and society and the future of work is that that's not really working for anyone anymore. And that the contract is obsolete. And what actually happens is that when you enter adulthood, you enter this really complex and confusing opportunity marketplace where you've got to pay for different learning and work opportunities. And so a big kind of core anchor theme in the book is we need to understand that the contract we're operating from and the architecture, the systems we're operating from, not only have um, deep equity implications, but they also are very due for an update and upgrade. Yeah, I do you find, I have so many questions from that, do you find there's anywhere in the country right now that's really trying to upgrade what education can look like for their system? Yeah, uh, I think absolutely. And the question is like, how much can you can you do inside of the system? Um, and I think it's hard, you know, like we changed the law back when when I was running that school to waive seat time, but we didn't realize it was like an infection. <laughs> like we didn't realize that actually time was everywhere. It was in how we reported attendance. It was the hours and days of the calendar. It was how you do credits and courses. And so you would pick up one piece of change and like a Chinese ladder toy, it would open up all of these other panels of things that had to be changed. And so I would say are there education change makers who are pushing on the boundaries of what's possible and working intensely to align what they're doing to the to the science of how kids learn and thrive 100%. It's happening all over the country. Are they under pressures and pushback um, because of the design of the systems, because of state policy? Absolutely. So they are wearier and less resourced than they have to be. And that makes everything tougher. Um, and so where you, what I'm really interested in right now are actually whole communities that are investing in their young residents and saying, you know what, schools on their own can't do it. What would it look like if every single system in space that works with young people, households, youth programs, employers, community programs, and schools collectively worked yep. on what the educational and preparation experience ne needs to be for kids and recognize that schools on their own by design can't, can't do it. Um, and that people who are working inside of that will always face limitations. Yeah, it sounds like, I mean, that's, that's advice for how can you go after it right now? It seems to me that you know, your premise, which I would also agree with that of how our system was designed and what it was designed for. Again, it was a, for the economy of that present day. Right. And you're making an argument and uh, I'm, I love how you framed it. Cause I think I've read plenty of articles on the future of work. Um, I, I just think it was just so digestible the way you put it. And so I feel like we've got to rework people's uh, understanding of what tomorrow's today and tomorrow's economy looks like and then backwards design from there. So give me some insight or give our listeners some insight on what the workforce looks like today and tomorrow. Yeah, I think planning with the end in mind is so important. And one of the big things that I advocate for in the book for educators and folks in youth development is that Right now, we often put the end at college and career readiness. Like, okay, we've done our job, warm handshake, pass off. And um, I, there are two things to consider there. The first is, 
the ways in which college and careers or credentials more accurately are changing, which we can talk about that here in a second on, on what that future is. Um, that's one of the things desperately in need of sort of an update or modernization. We need an accurate view of what the working life and learning life of adults will look like moving forward. Um, so I think, you know, that is a key piece. But the other part is that actually, I think the goal should be a long and livable life. Because one of the things that blew me away as a, as a parent and as an educator, when I was writing the book was learning that today's kids, if they have the right resources and supports, could live, should live as a rule and not an exception to be a hundred. And if we think about that, then the question is, so between Dustin and I, um, we have five boys and, you know, Henry is the littlest, what is he, seven months now? Yep. <laughs> and then Justice is the oldest and he's 10. Um, and so in their little lives, Henry included seven months to 10, there's been pandemics, there's been shootings, there's been economic crisis. There's been incredible innovation. Justice at 10 is born three years after um, the smartphone and Twitter and all of these pieces. I announced we were having a baby on Facebook. His digital biography starts without his permission when he's in my womb. Um, they are in every way possible digital and disruption natives. And as they get older, the economy and the environment, politically, socially, weather, all of it, is going to be changing rapidly. And so it's not just that they're, they have the potential of living a long life, but what could happen inside of those years? And then what we also know is if our five boys had been born um, into families and communities that were struggling more financially, different race, different makeup, different geographic, that the chance that they would even get that long life is really subject. Yep. And so um, I would say, you know, back to sort of how the future is, is changing, what we see and what I, what I talk about, which was not a part of any professional development or educator training that I got, is um, that there are these three major forces that are just changing everything. And they are why our kids are disruption and digital natives. The first is machines, the actual like rise in use of tech. Um, and, you know, I in the book, I, I talk about an incredible pediatric cardiologist who lives here in St. Louis and how she uses artificial intelligence um, and a hollow lens. She puts on this big helmet um, to be able to see her patient's hearts before she goes into the operating room. And the stakes are the highest. These are little babies' hearts, little kids' hearts, right? Their parents are waiting while she does this high stakes operation. And so Jen, the cardiologist and I, we, we explored in our conversations and have over the years I've known her, the simple technologies she interfaces with every day and that we interface with every day um, and that we rely on, but all the way to really sophisticated technology. And so a big thing in thinking about the kids we're working with and raising, educating and counseling is that there is a tech touch relationship that is unavoidable and unprecedented. And that our kids are going to have to understand not only how they work inside of tech, but how they work with tech and in some cases for tech. And it's changing the job market. So some jobs are being taken up by technology some jobs are changing because technology is absorbing big pieces of it. Um, they call that sort of a taskified workforce where some tasks are human and some tasks are tech. And then some jobs are actually people who are feeding technology 
in a more junior position. One thing that I think is important, um, again, sort of setting into my identity as a mom is um, we need to understand the role of technology. We need to have an understanding of also how young people's relationship with technology is different from our own. But the other piece is artificial intelligence, which is like the robots who are most like us. It runs off of what is predictable and programmed. So what artificial intelligence does really, really well, when you think about robots, when you think about big data, when you think about sort of these big techie conversations, is that it very, very quickly, sometimes faster than humans, gets and processes information and makes predictable decisions. It is much less able to handle the fragile and the unpredictable. And so one of the big takeaways here is one of the best ways to manage a tech touch relationship is that our boys and other kids just have to be humans. They have to be really good at navigating and doing the unpredictable, the fragile and the relational. You mm -hmm. know, I'll, I'll just uh, stop at just one more thing, like thinking about Jen. So this cardiologist at St. Louis Children's is also a mom. She's got two kids and um, and I share this in the in the book, but I think it's worth saying like at the end of our actual kind of official book interview, she said, you know, Stephanie, one last thing, like no matter what technology is available, if your kids' lives were on the line, you would never forgive me if I didn't use every resource I could. And if I didn't know about and how to use every resource that could save their lives, mostly in tech but you also would never leave the life of your child in the hands of a robot. You would want it to be me. And I think that that illuminated so much the complexity and the promise of that piece. Um, the, the second is around momentum. And I actually don't think we have to spend too much time on this one because everyone feels it. Yeah. Like this is just the overwhelm, right? This is all the things, all of the time. Um, I talk in the book about this idea of like information obesity, like we are weighed down by too much. And that kids are just growing up in a time where there are constant demands. Um, and, and so between momentum, kind of the rapid change of everything yep. and this innovation and acceleration and disruption that's brought on by tech, you're left with the need for young people to really be able to sort of plug in and unplug at will, um, which is really important and, and worth us paying attention to, particularly coming out of a pandemic where kids had to be plugged in for more hours than not into technology during the day, during a time of rapid change and disruption. And so the, the third big four, so you've got machines, you have momentum, and then this third piece is, so what is all of that doing to the market? What is all of that doing to the way in which we operate with each other? that we seek out education and employment and um, and engage, you know, through through commerce and through the economy. And what actually do those big um, things, what impact does that have on students and their and their future? Um, Similarly, you know, I think markets, we would have had to spend a lot more time talking about it if the pandemic didn't happen, because I think every family in America, arguably around the world, um, is coming out of this global pandemic and every educator with a much deeper understanding that the quality of life and the quality of learning are deeply interlinked and that you can't separate them and that the ways in which the world is functioning economically and practically is going to trickle all the way down to the lived experience of these kids and how they are learning and developing. So I've got a few questions. One is kind of more macro as I think about, uh, again, preparing as an educator, preparing kids for this world, right? One of the um, 
statements that I saw in your book was, you know, talking about our high school diplomas are not a sign of readiness for work. And I'm curious to know how we can fix that. Okay, so we're going to get super practical. Um, so I think that there are some real policy and practice things that we can do. Um, I want to go back to your question around like, are there people who are doing this work around the country, right? And so I think that we see some policymakers and practitioners making really big inroads. And I heard somebody um, talk a couple months ago actually around like abolition and advocacy and the need for like, how do we support students in the world and the systems as they are, even as we are designing new? And that actually was the purpose of making it. So like, this is not a book, making it is not a book about how kids can thrive and develop character and flourish, which I have lots of opinions around, you know, maybe future book. Like this was, what are the operating rules of a world that is still unjust and unfair? And can we get really honest about what it's gonna take to navigate that space, to have, you know, in order to have a good life, you have to first have a decent, life and quality of life and quality of learning experience. So at the high school level, you know, a couple of big wins is that almost every state has now done away with those arbitrary seat time requirements that I mentioned to you, the minutes for credit. But there's still a lot of work combing through all of those local policies and state policies to see where time shows up. Time is often proxy for progress. And we need to focus on what actually can kids do and can they move on when they're ready? You know, this is not about age, it's about stage. Are they are they ready to, to move on? Can they slow down and speed up based on what they need? And so practically thinking about how do young people earn credit and move forward? So the places doing this best have adopted competency-based education and proficiency-based approaches to graduation and to, to courses. The second is that um, school boards and school leadership simply need to engage with community members, particularly employers in higher education, and go to the wall and look at those graduation requirements and the content standards and ask the very basic question of, is this the map that matches to the end in mind that you talked about. If they do these things, are they actually ready for what comes next? Is this a true signaling of preparation for post-secondary education and for employment? And if not, how do we need to retool what is in our um, space of authority to do as a local school board or a local school in our student handbooks and with our staffs and how much can we push out and then when do we actually need to engage state policymakers? you know education is something that is truly local not only local control but um, national federal folks can set agendas and offer grants but everything really happens transactionally at the state and local level um, so updating the graduation requirements, combing the policies for these proxies, are we using completion as a proxy for competence? You know, well, they finished it, so they must be ready instead of, oh, they have the skills and habits and experiences that they need. Are we using time as a proxy for progress? Are we using access while well, they took the class? as a proxy for quality. Well, was it a good one? How was the teacher? What was the experience like? Um, and so I would say, you know, educators need to figure out, do they have these harmful proxies as stand-ins um, that are not truly centered on what the young person needs? So those policy changes, the practice changes. And the last thing that I'll say is, you know, everybody should, read the book and have a book. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, not kidding. Everybody should read the book. But I think that um, if the point of school and the mission of districts and schools are to prepare future citizens, to prepare them for college and careers, you know, this is every mission statement in every school and district in the United States, then there is a moral and ethical obligation to step back and ask, 
are we really directing in that way? Because what ends up happening, and this is the core of the book, is if you are a poor kid, if you are sitting at the margins and school is the only place where you are being prepared and they tell you, if you just show up and do this, you're gonna be okay. If you just get the credential, if you just complete the classes, it's a deep disappointment. When I started the school and you and I met, it was for youth who were pushed or pulled out of school. But I had no idea the number of kids who had been pulled through school, who then got a diploma and really believed they were ready and they weren't. Yeah, I mean, Steph, we've seen, it's unfortunately our, our country is littered with those type of stories. I, you know, part of me thinks as you're, you're as I think about either the high school principal or a superintendent, <laughs> You know, there are schools that are getting really high marks by the education system that we have. I mean, there are blue ribbon schools, best of the best. And it, it's very clear to me that all of the schools need to reevaluate what they're doing, who they're doing it for. I just think, I, I wonder how do we help those people who are leading those blue ribbon schools have the courage to hit the pause button and rethink this because it feels good to get rewarded for things that you've always done and you're comfortable. So what, like, how do we help people get that courage to hit the pause button and say, we've got to shake this up. We got to do better. It's a really good question because becoming a blue ribbon school and getting good marks and being um, well reviewed on like great schools um, not only feels good, but it's an incentive, right? There are deep rewards there. And um, in the book, I, I talk about um, not only the glass ceiling, but what my colleague and a researcher at Brookings, um, Richard Reeves calls the um, glass floor. And this is the idea that, you know, in a lot of communities and for a lot of kids, um, they are born into such a resource rich environment and community. And it just kind of builds on itself and it's not accessible for other young people. Being a blue ribbon school, being getting high marks on great schools is absolutely indicative of dedicated educators and hardworking leaders. It's also often indicative of some other social conditions and structural conditions about the neighborhood, the resourcing, the racial demographic, the social capital, other resources and supports that are being just injected into that school environment and particularly environments where, where kids are coming from households where they're engaging in an array of rich, healthy, vibrant experiences from athletics to the arts, to faith community, other spaces, the schools get the dividends. You know, these are kids that are picking up resources and supports and advantages and opportunities and bringing them into the school. And then it's reflective on the whole I think that what has happened in the last year with the racial uprisings and with the deep disparities that were spotlighted during the pandemic, it provides the humble space for any leader to step back and examine without fear of incredible pushback, I would hope. I think that Often, um, those of us who are charging on the activism side can't understand all that's at stake um, for folks to admit that they are wrong or the things that aren't working. And it's okay to like have a dignified path to give somebody. And I think this is it. There's a national conversation on anti-racism, on disparities, on equity and justice. And that is an open door for these leaders, um, particularly under new leadership that is encouraging it to be able to have the conversation and to kind of have the backing of the national discourse in the pandemic. 
as supports to, to be able to push harder and reflect more deeply than maybe they would have been able to before. Yeah, I, I know our time's getting close, but I, I, I hope that as we're engaging this conversation, what has always drawn me to you and what I hope draws anybody who's an educator who thinks about innovation and wants to think about the future of what our kids need, which hopefully is everybody, uh, needs to dive into your book and know who you are, just to know that you're not scared to tackle complex issues and you want to help take it from the macro all the way down to the micro. And so, uh, you know, our last question we always ask is like some encouragement of change that you can encourage us with. But before we get there, um, one of the key components of your book that you keep coming back to is this um, breakdown of competencies and currencies. Can you kind of just explain that so folks, as they pick up your book, they at least have an idea of where your head is around those? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll try to, you know, brevity is not my strength. So I'll try to do it quickly. Um, so I want to bring us back in the conversation and hopefully listeners have, have tuned in for the whole thing here to that outdated social contract. And that actually like in adulthood, kids, kids are going to be engaging in this complex opportunity marketplace where they're going to have to pay for learning and work opportunities. Everything has a cost, it's a reality. And so the, the middle of the book really deals with, so if everything has a cost to actually advance um, economically, then what are the currencies that are accepted in this marketplace? And so I offer four. Um, and the idea is that actually every kid, depending on their circumstances, is going to need different amounts of each. Um, that's just a reality. And some kids are born with a lot and some kids are born with very little. And some kids have trouble even accessing the marketplace to begin with. Um, so this is not to say the marketplace is right or well designed, but simply to say, like, this is what it is. Um, and those four currencies are competencies, which you mentioned, which is what are the knowledge, habits and skills that young people really need? How what are their ways of being and doing in the world that will serve them across their lifetime, across a lifetime of learning and work? Things like the ability to focus and organize or think critically and creatively, um, you know, like this is Franklin Covey, right? So like those deep habits of being effective, um, relating to people. So competencies is the first, you know, Kids are gonna get opportunities. Adults are gonna get opportunities if they can showcase what they know and can do. The second is to prove their credibility. They still need credentials. Credentials still matter, even if they're a proxy, even if you have a credential and it doesn't actually mean it reflects what you know and can do, employers still value it. And there are employers who are dropping credentialing requirements, but for now the data is clear. If you have a high school diploma and then if you have advanced degrees, a college degree and forward, your chances to succeed economically continue to go up. The next two um, currencies are maybe the most important and the least talked about in education, and that's connections. It is as important who you know as what you know and can do and cash things cost money. And there are things that cost money that we don't realize. A public education can be expensive if the scholarship opportunities, participating in the athletics, the academics, being a part of clubs and experiences all have costs associated for, you know, for the booster club, for the uniforms, for the travel, for the equipment, for the tutoring, for the, the coaching. Um, we don't talk about cash and we need to. Um, and there are ways in which learning is impacted when you're experiencing cash scarcity, certainly poverty, but also cash scarcity, financial crisis in your family. Um, you know, our brain structure actually changes. So as educators, we need to know what to do to support kids in understanding money and financial health, but also how to keep them learning and moving forward, even in periods when they're poor. Um, and there are ways to do that. And so those four currencies together kind of make up 
what what kids need and and they can be learned earned or inherited um and so the end of the book is all about as adults how can we be currency builders what would it look like to take that on as the call yeah and again i would say that to me is one of the more compelling pieces is i get to learn about what the future of the world could look like and work and dive all the way down into like very practical things that i can do as an educator or as a parent or just someone involved uh with kids anywhere um you have so many well thought out uh pieces of advice i'm just curious right now is there anything on your head or heart that um as you know we always come at the end of the podcast we want to ask every guest is, you know, to make the kind of change that you're talking about here, what's one step that I can take as an educator to, to, you know, follow, follow your advice and wisdom. So I'm going to cheat and actually borrow from the introduction of the book. So in the middle of, um, final edits, I called my brother, I was down in Florida and I was driving across the state this like crocodile alley across Florida. And uh, I called him panicked because I was thinking about the book. <clears throat> he had been a journalist. And I said, oh my God, Mark, I'm writing a book about education. And should I be writing a book about mental health? Every person I am talking to is talking about how overwhelmed and overloaded and stressed and stretched kids and educators and leaders are, and I don't know what to do. <laughs> and so he said, put it up front. So I did, I wrote it in the introduction. I write about talking to Mark, but here's the thing that I just wanna say at the end, like we're in a little bit of a um, put your mask on first moment. We've all just come through a collective trauma a deep, stressful, um, horrific trauma. And for many educators, leaders, students, and families, that has been compounded by individual loss, stress, anxiety, depression, loss of jobs, incredible things. And so all of what I said in terms of how the world operates is true. But the ability to live and show up right now is all about our collective healing. And so we're in a moment right now where vaccinations are happening. The world seems to be opening up in these sort of micro ways. Um, but my last encouragement would be take some time to journal, to reflect, to have a conversation on what has been revealed in this year? Because the thing I know about trauma, and unfortunately I know some stuff about trauma, is that distance creates a dislocation and it's easy to forget. And it's important that there are things revealed to us this year that we can't forget because we're gonna be tending to those wounds moving forward. Our kids can't have a long life of learning and work absent the ability to live full lives. And so there is a need to prioritize, I think, above all else, the, frankly, just the health and well-being of kids and educators and the people who've been running our schools and our households this past year. So Steph, I, I know there's gonna be a lot of people that wanna learn more about you. So obviously uh, they need to read your book, but are there other ways uh, that they can continue to follow you, get to know you better um, through social media or any other outlet? Thanks for asking. I think there are three different ways. If you wanna work together, um, if you want me to come and speak to your school or work with your district or your organization, you can check me out on my website. Um, and that's www.stephaniemaliakraus.com. Um, and pretty sure the show notes will have the spelling of my name. And if you want to follow me on, on Twitter, that's at Stephanie underscore Malia. And that has both an education and youth development bent. 
Um, and if you want to take on my family's crazy journey of actually withdrawing our kids and homeschooling this past year and buying a very old, complicated, in need of repairs RV, um, I'm on Instagram and that's at wonder underscore and underscore wayfinding. So we'll, we'll make sure that's in the notes. Uh, and again, people are maybe just be meeting you and your husband, you guys um have been incredibly passionate since the moment i met both of you uh about fighting for equity in this country and fighting for opportunity for everyone and so this isn't just something you got excited about to write a book about this is something that you've lived and evan lives and so thank you both but definitely thank you for this opportunity for joining us but as well as for your courage to continue to push the envelope and try to push for more for all of us i really appreciate it and you're a breath of fresh air and I wish you nothing but the best. So thank you, Steph. Thanks, my friend. Please support us by subscribing to our YouTube channel, uh, podcast on Apple or Spotify, and help us celebrate the beautiful, messy work of shaping human potential.